This conference will now be recorded. In the last class, we studied about the anatomy and physiology of paranasal sinuses. A brief recap of what the last class we studied. And in today's class, we'll be studying about the rhinosinusitis, the disease process which affecting the paranasal sinuses. So, as we know, the sinuses are the hollow cavities which are present in the skull, which are four in number, four face in number, which includes the maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid sinus. As the name indicates here, frontal, maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid. And brief recap of the function of the paranasal sinuses. It acts as the resonators of the void and it reduces the weight of the skull base. It also protects the eye and intracranial structures like brain. So, due to increased temp intra, I mean, temperature and also it also protects uh, from accidents due to the empty spaces present in the skull. It also increases the overall surface area, especially the olfactory surface area. And now coming to the development of sinuses, as I said in the previous class, among the four sinuses, maxillary and ethmoid sinuses are present at birth and later sphenoid and frontal sinus will develop at a later age. The last sinus will be the frontal sinus. Among these, you will be getting the MCQ point of view also I told, which is the sinus present at birth, maxillary and ethmoid. And the last sinus to develop is the frontal sinus. And now coming to the sinusitis proper, what does sinusitis mean? Sinusitis is nothing but inflammation of the lining of the mucosa of the paranasal sinuses. And now the sinusitis term has been renamed as rhinosinusitis. Uh, whether it is acute or chronic, it is named as rhinosinusitis, acute rhinosinusitis, ARS, or chronic rhinosinusitis, CRS. Why like that? Previously, we used to call as sinusitis and now rhinosinusitis. Sinuses mean paranasal sinuses, rhinus it means nose. Okay. Both because the nasal mucosa, the mucosa of the nasal cavity and the mucosa of the sinuses are both similar, which are in continuity with each other. So uh, the term rhinosinusitis is being preferred term compared to sinusitis. Apart from the uh, apart from that, other reason why we use the term rhinosinusitis is sinusitis rarely occurs without rhinus rhinitis. So, usually sinusitis is preceded, preceded by or accompanied by rhinitis. So, rhinosinusitis rhino is the preferred term compared to sinusitis. Okay. Whether it may be acute or chronic. So, you, you have to use the word acute rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis, not simply sinusitis. Okay. Now, coming to the pathophysiology of paranasal sinuses, usually we know the sinuses function is to uh, secrete the nasal uh, mucosa. I mean, mucosal secretions will be present, I mean, secreted constantly in the nas sinus sinuses cavities. And these sinuses are lined by respiratory epithelial and mucosa. The normal function of the sinuses is to ventilate and mucosal drainage. So, this normal function of sinuses will be dependent upon the patent ostia, ciliary function, and quality of mucosa. As I said in the previous class, every sinus will be having an opening. Uh, maxillary sinus is having an opening which will be opening into the middle meatus and the frontal sinus having a frontal recess through which it drains through frontal nasal tract it drains into the middle meatus and sphenoid ostium and ethmoid sinus all will be having the respective ostia through which the mucus will be drained uh, into respective meatus either middle meatus or superior meatus and and this sinusitis mainly caused mainly due to this any abnormality of this ostia or as we said, for the normal movement of the mucosal secretions, we have uh, there should be a cilia functioning. If there is any disturbance in the ciliary function, this may also lead to abnormal stasis of mucosal secretions, and it may lead to bacterial colonization, and it may lead to sinusitis. So either any abnormality in ostia of the respective sinusitis uh, sinuses, or any abnormality of the function of the cilia which are present in the sinus, I mean, lining epithelium. Or if there is any quality or change in the mucosal secretions, or quality, uh, it may become thick or something abnormal secretions, abnormal contents, mucus content or water content. If there is any abnormality in these mucosal content or quality, it may also lead to sinusitis. This the main uh, pathophysiology physiology is mainly broadly classified into these three categories. Depends upon the patent ostia, the ciliary function, and the quality of 
mucosa and mucosal secretions. Okay. So, so based on these uh, three factors, what uh, what I said, the functions of the sinus, I mean mucosa, uh, these class etiologies uh, divide into three types. Either it is maybe osteal obstruction or non-osteal obstruction or direct extinction. So mainly the causes or etiology of sinus rhinosinusitis can be divided into osteal obstruction. What does this mean, osteal obstruction? Either there is anatomical or physiological obstruction to the respective osteo or maxillary osteum or frontal, any obstruction which impairs the drainage of mucosal secretions, it may cause, it may lead to sinusitis or rhinosinusitis or non-osteal obstruction. Now what does this mean? Non-osteal obstruction mean any abnormality in the ciliary function. As I said in the pre before, uh, ciliary function causes abnormality in the ciliary function causes may lead categorized into non-osteal obstruction. And what does this direct extinction mean? Any infection from the cheek or tooth, I mean, any trauma or dental infection may lead to direct extinction. So, briefly, if we say what does osteal obstruction, what comes under osteal obstruction, any anatomical, uh, any anatomical variations or abnormalities of the nasal or sinus cavities may lead to osteal obstruction. So, what does this osteal obstruction or anatomical variations mean? So, in osteal obstruction, we will be having the causes the, what are the causes which may obstruct the ostia and lead to uh, sinusitis, rhinosinusitis? What is it? May be inflammation, simple upper respiratory tract infection, or allergic rhinitis. The most common cause or predisposing factor for rhinosinusitis is upper respiratory tract infection. So you may be having a question, or if you ask about the etiology of rhinosinusitis, the most, you should mention the most common cause for acute rhinosinusitis is upper respiratory tract infection, which may be viral, usually it's, usually it's caused by viral. And the second most common cause is allergic rhinitis. Uh, there are different types of rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, vasomotor rhinitis, or like this. But the most second most common only after upper respiratory tract infection is allergic rhinitis. Which so what this starts there will be sinusal mucosal inflammation and there will be edema surrounding the ostium. So that due to this edi uh, edema, uh, the ostium sinus respective ostium of sinuses will be blocked and there will be impairment of mucosal secretions. So apart from these ostial obstruction. The other mechanical causes, what are these mechanical causes? Nothing but anatomical causes or anatomical variations. So if there is any septal deviation like DNS either to right, as you see in the picture, there is a deviation of the septum to the side, right side, and then the obstruction to the drainage of the respective meatuses or sinus secretions, and there will be opposite side compensatory hypertrophy of the turbinates, either inferior turbinate, which is most commonly hypertrophic, and along with this, superior turbinate and middle turbinate. So these hypertrophied turbinates and along with deviated nasal septum may also cause impair the secretions uh, or block the sinus ostia. And along with those polyps, very intranasal, sinonasal polyps, we usually call, or any tumors affecting the nasal cavity, or simply adenoid hypertrophy. Adenoid, which are present in the posterior nasal concentration and any foreign body in the nasal cavities and congenital abnormalities of the cleft palate. So usually these congenital abnormalities of the cleft palate may also lead to any osteal obstruction which impair the sinus drainage. Now coming to the non-osteal obstruction as I said previous, uh, previous slide or in any function which affects the ciliary movement or say uh, ciliary function, ciliary movement function, it may cause non-osteal obstruction. So what does this, uh, what, can, what comes under this non-osteal obstruction is any uh, diseases which affect the motility of cilia. As we know, we are all aware of the syndrome like Cartaginous syndrome, uh, which is also known as immotine cilia syndrome. We will be having a triad of sinusitis, bronchitis, and situs inverses. Situs inverses means usually if we all be having the heart on the left side. In situs inverses, in those patients, the heart will be present on the right side. Uh, actual meaning is situs inverses means the normal. 
okay this any syndromes right and under condition is cystic fibrosis in this cystic fibrosis there will be uh, i mean disturbance in the electrolytes especially sodium and chloride which may impair the ciliary motility and may cause stasis of mucosal secretions and it may lead to sinusitis so especially this non postural obstruction may be mostly due to ciliary dysfunction which which may be seen in cystic fibrosis patients or immotile cilia or cartagena syndrome patients and along with this any immune disorders immune uh, function disorders like wegener's granulomatosis lymphoma and immunosuppressed patients like we all know neutropenics diabetics hiv these all people comes under immunosuppressed patients these may also these are more prone to uh, infections uh, may be due to the ciliary dysfunction and now come to the third etiology direct extension what does this direct extension mean as in the previous class i mentioned this maxillary sinus is more nearer the floor of the maxillary sinus is more nearer to the tooth or dental so if any dental processes like extraction of tooth or any processes involving cleaning of tooth any it may refer pain also to the face and any extraction of tooth that infection may spread into the maxillary sinus because the floor is uh may be we we can uh, at that uh, extraction of tooth area and if any inadvertent oriental fistula may also come, uh, can occur if there is improper extraction of dental tooth with tooth and apart from that trauma or facial fractures any fractures involving the skull or face these infections from the soft tissues and facial other structures may spread into the paranasal sinuses and may lead to bacterial colonization and further lead to rhino sinusitis so now coming to the risk factors uh, which all comes under etiological factors also the most common cause is a upper respiratory tract infection or simply called as common cold most which is a major predisposing factor at all ages and other risk factors include cystic fibrosis immunodeficiency hiv infection as i said these all comes under non osseal obstruction causes which may are due to ciliary motility uh, dysfunction and apart from those nasogastric or nasal tracheal intubation as we all familiar with these procedures which are known as nosocomial or hydrogenic infections because nasogastric tube or nasotracheal tube infection will be passing through this uh, nasal cavity and it also causes any anatomical obstruction because it is obstructing the normal patency of the nose any or it is like just a foreign particle which is present in the nasal cavity so any nasogastric or nasotracheal intubation also uh, causes uh, the impairment of sinus mucosal secretions along with this nasal polyposis nasal foreign body cold air tumor rhinitis allergic rhinitis so anything that blocks the mucus from existing the sinuses predisposes them to inflammation so this is the dictum or point line uh, baseline uh, anything that block mucus from existing the exiting from existing from the sinuses ostia predisposes them to inflammation so these all causes lead to mucosal stasis and mucosal inflammation and further rhino sinusitis now coming up after the pathophysiology and etiology of rhino sinusitis now what are the main causes what are the bacteria which causes the rhino sinusitis include the most common bacteria include streptococcus pneumonia and h influenza and moraxella catarrhi these three are the most common bacteria which causes sinusitis apart from this there are other uh, bacteria which causes staph aureus streptococci and anaerobic infections so and usually these will be present in the immunocompetent patients in immunocompromised patients or uh, patients like hiv or diabetes these the sinusitis usually it is not of bacterial origin it is mostly of fungal origin which may be caused by aspergillus or zygomat i mean mucor and rhizopus which may be most commonly seen in neutrophilic patients and immunocompromised patients okay so uh, every flow chart of the etiology etiology coming to the viral, usually the patient will be started as viral upper respiratory infections or common cold it may lead to edema around the sinus ostia and it also may lead to paralysis of cilia or ciliary motility uh, impairment function and it leads to stasis of mucosal secretions and further lead to secondary bacterial infections hello able to follow
yes yes okay fine and this is a yes, cycle sir. this is a maxillary sinus this is a mucosal lining of the maxillary sinus which is constantly secreting the mucosa uh, secretions and this is ostia which is present on the higher side of the upper side of the medial wall of the maxillary the lateral nasal wall or medial maxillary wall and if there is any impairment of the if there is any block or edema around the sinus ostia the secretions will be pulled here there will be stagnation of secretions you can see the yellow colorish or it may be greenish color or simply a watery in color and it may lead to stages of secretions here and it may lead to sinusitis sinus sinusitis and before and now coming to the classification of based on the rhino sinusitis according to the duration we will be calling acute rhino sinusitis if the duration of rhino sinusitis is less than or four weeks if it is called subacute rhino sinusitis if the duration is 1 to 3 months and it is called chronic if there is more than 3 months duration of features then here and before it is also known other terms which comes here as pan sinusitis and multi sinusitis apart from acute chronic and subacute other terms are pan sinusitis and multi sinusitis what does multi sinusitis mean if if there is a involvement of more than one or one sinuses it is known as multi sinusitis if as we know there are four sinusite four sinuses in our uh, skull if there is involvement of all the four sinuses it is known as pan sinusitis multi means one or two sinuses more than one it may be two or three if it involves all the four sinuses it is known as pan sinusitis and under terminology will be coming uh, which will be come across is open sinusitis and closed sinusitis what does this open sinusitis and closed sinusitis mean here if there is although there is uh, edema and inflammation around the sinus ostia if there is sinus i mean if there is uh, this sinus ostia is open and there will be no uh, hurdle for the drainage of the sinus secretions into the through the sinus ostia into the middle meatus and through the nose it is known as opus open uh, sinusitis if the sinus uh, ostium is blocked completely and then there will be no transport of mucosal secretions outside it is known as closed sinusitis so that is does this make any difference in clinically means in open sinusitis usually the symptoms will be less severe or uh, less worse compared to closed sinusitis because the uh, constant uh, secretions which are uh, present here will be drained through the respective ostia uh, and in closed sinusitis the secretions keep on pooling here and it will may lead to further worsening of more worsening of symptoms compared to open sinusitis so now coming to this how to differentiate between viral and bacterial as i said the rhino sinusitis is mostly common caused by the virus and it may also caused by the bacteria and also fungal but among the viruses the rhino viruses are the most common cause of uh, rhino sinusitis which is usually preceded by the upper respiratory tract tract infections like right? common cold and but now coming to the question how will you differentiate the viral and bacterial usually in viral rhino sinusitis the symptoms will be less severe and it also will be of less duration usually if the symptoms are of less duration like less than 10 days duration and if the symptoms are less severe if the onset of the symptoms are less severe usually will be considered as viral rhino sinusitis and if there is improvement of uh, symptoms within 10 days usually the symptom i mean it is characterized as viral rhino sinusitis but now what comes as bacterial rhino sinusitis is if the patient presents with persistent symptoms what does this mean persistent symptoms so if the symptoms of the patient will not improve beyond 10 days i mean within 10 days if it progresses beyond 10 days but less than 30 days and then it is known as acute bacterial sinusitis rhino sinusitis acute because as we said in the previous slide we will be considered as chronic only uh, only acute only if there is a duration of less than 1 month or 30 days so if the symptoms persists beyond 10 days and less than 30 days it will be called as acute bacterial rhinosinusitis rhinosinusitis if the symptoms present uh, persists less than 10 days will be called as acute viral rhinosinusitis 
so able to make out the difference here and other hello okay yes sir and other category which comes under bacterial rhinosinusitis if the patient presents with onset the presenting is itself the worsening symptoms or if the patient presents initially there is a response within uh, 10 days if the patient responds and if there is uh, a symptomatic period and again patient presents uh, immediately after symptomatic relief and again patient presents with symptoms then it will also categorized as bacterial rhinosinusitis so any symptoms less than 10 days duration and with less severity and improved within 10 days comes under acute bacterial viral category and which persists beyond 10 days and comes under within 10 30 days and with worsening symptoms or initial onset with severe symptoms comes under bacterial rhinosinusitis so now comes what does basically acute and chronic as we know uh during based on the duration acute rhinosinusitis it comes within less than i mean is categorized as acute ars or ars as if the duration is less than 1 month or 30 days but crs will be categorized if the duration is more than 3 months usually if the symptoms of acute rhinosinusitis ars and crs will be more or less the same like fever facial pressure every like sorry Uh, but the symptoms like fever facial pain usually absent in chronic rhinosinusitis because uh, in acute phase usually having the first episode of the phase the, there will be high uh, activity of the white blood cells and there will be uh, synthesization of uh, leukotrienes cytokines everything uh, compared to chronic rhinosinusitis usually the patient will be having fever and facial pain though facial pain or facial pressure is present in chronic rhinosinusitis but usually this fever and uh, pyrexia or facial pain usually absent in chronic rhinosinusitis compared to the acute rhinosinusitis so these are the brief uh, uh, differentiation between viral and bacterial and acute and chronic now coming to the definition as i said before how will you uh, diagnose acute separative sinusitis or acute bacterial sinus rhinosinusitis usually this rhinosinusitis is a clinical diagnosis make make point here it is a clinical diagnosis so what are the clinical what does this clinical diagnosis mean it is based on symptoms and signs so the clinical criteria or diagnostic criteria for this uh, acute separative sinusitis or acute bacterial rhinosinusitis is it can be categorized as two types major symptoms and minor symptoms what comes under major symptoms on what comes under minor symptoms is the list if you have any two major symptoms or if you have one major symptom and two minor symptoms it comes it, clinically we can say the patient may be suffering with acute uh, rhinosinusitis okay so now what comes under these major symptoms include facial pain or pressure you will be having tenderness and facial pressure and facial puffiness and facial congestion so you will be having erythema over the cheeks or forehead region and there will be swelling of the eyelids or facial fullness there will be swelling of the cheeks eyelids everything and there will be also redness or erythema around the cheeks or forehead region and eyelid region and there will be also pain and pressure and and also that apart from this nasal obstruction or apart from this fever hypospadia or anosmia hypospadia or anosmia means there will be decreased sensation of smell hypo means decrease anosmia means complete absence of smell and also this pulling or discolored nasal discharge it may be yellowish color or greenish in color these all will be categorized in major symptoms so if you have any two major symptoms you can clinically suspect the patient as acute separative sinusitis or acute bacterial rhinosinusitis able to follow now yes sir now coming yes, to sir. minor now uh, okay now coming to the minor symptoms headache halitosis halitosis means bad breath or bad smell if the patient is having uh, if you have a conversation with any patient you will be getting bad breath or bad smell from that patient which is known as halitosis which this halitosis is not is because of the pulmonary secretions uh, stagnations stagnation of the nasal secretions and colonization of the bacteria either may be aerobic or anaerobic and it may leads to halitosis 
so underneath fatigue fatigue means easily uh, becoming sick i mean uh, not having uh, sufficient energy dental pain as i said usually in maxillary sinusitis usually the patient usually presents with dental pain and it should not surprise if the patient visits any dental surgeon or dental practitioner presenting with a dental pain but if the usually most of the patient presenting with dental pain the maxillary sinusitis should also be ruled out because it may present solely as a dental pain because the floor of the maxillary sinus is related to the maxilla which is having the upper molar tooth and premolar tooth so other symptom is cough usually dry cough will be present if there is a symptom of uh, allergic uh, predisposing factor and it may also present with wet cough also and usually present with ear fullness or ear pressure what does ear pressure or ear fullness related to the sinusitis how does this connect because there will be edema also around the eustachian tube orifice which is present on the posterior end of the middle turbinate region i mean inferior turbinate region in the coena so any uh, inflammation which blocks this eustachian tube orifice will be lead will disequilibrium of the pressure in the eustachian tube middle ear and the nasopharynx and it leads to oral fullness or ear pressure so these are the minor symptoms minor symptoms are headache halitosis or bad breath fatigue dental pain cough and ear pressure so any two major symptoms or can be categorized as ars or if there is having patient having one major symptom and two minor symptoms also we can categorize as ars so this this point is clear this slide is very important for the clinical point of diagnosis so as i said how to differentiate viral and bacterial and children are more prone to bacterial etiology than adults but viral is still more common so now coming to which sinuses are more prone in children and which sinusitis are more prone in adults as i said in the previous class and also beginning of this uh, lecture usually the sinuses which are present at birth are maxillary sinus and ethmoid sinus right so usually children in children the sinusitis which are present more commonly is nothing but maxillary sinus and ethmoid sinusitis in adults the sinuses which are most commonly affected are maxillary sinus though bacterial etiology as i said bacteria is less common compared to viral etiology in children compared to the maxillary sinusitis ethmoid sinusitis is more common than maxillary sinusitis so you, in the mcq point of view you may get a question like this which sinusitis is more common you may get the four options maxillary ethmoid frontal and sphenoid you have to opt like uh, maxillary sinusitis but if the question is specific which sinusitis is more common in children if the question is specific in children you have if you are having both options like maxillary and sinusitis maxillary and ethmoid uh, maxillary ethmoid frontal and uh, sphenoid you have to opt for opt for ethmoid sinusitis rather than maxillary sinusitis if both options are present in the same option uh, you may opt both but if you are having a single option you have to opt for ethmoid sinusitis but in adults it is a maxillary sinusitis which is more commonly affected and apart from viral and bacterial we should also rule out the fungal etiology especially in the immunocompromised host uh, who comes under immunocompromised is uh, these diabetic patients and uh, i mean hiv patients all these patients comes under Uh, immunocompromised patients usually in these patients fungal etiology is more common <clears throat> once again review uh, brief review of the organisms viral is most common which is uh, rhinovirus is most common and coming to the bacteria staph pneumonia streptococcus pneumonia h influenza varicella and anaerobes are the most common causes of bacterial etiology so again as i said uh, this ARS can be categorized into four types: maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid, based on the sinuses which affects, which is affected. Now, coming to the acute maxillary sinusitis, as I said, this is the most commonly affected sinus. So, now coming to the etiology, as I said, dental infections is the most common etiology or most common cause which may lead to maxillary sinusitis. Uh, these dental infections include uh, periapical dental abscess or tooth extraction or any infection. ascending from dental uh, tooth 
and any infections or contamination of the nasal mucosa secretions in diving or swimming in contaminated waters and apart from this trauma taste fractures which are include penetrating fractures also may lead to acute maxillary sinusitis so etiology coming constitution and uh, clinical features include constitution symptoms like fever myalgia lethargic this is all comes under constitution symptoms and other symptoms are headache pain tenderness redness and edema of the cheek in nasal discharge and post nasal discharge so uh, i will tell in the next slide next few slides how to differentiate pain and discharge in different uh, aspects of sinusitis different types of sinusitis in the examination point of in examination part so you will be seeing here this is a diagnosis in the exit maxillary sinusitis usually x-ray paranasal sinuses will be ordering as i said clinical diagnosis of uh, usually the rhinosinusitis is a clinical diagnosis apart from this we will be ordering x-ray pns which will be a gold standard apart uh, along with the ct pns x-ray pns in x-ray pns we will be seeing this is a maxillary sinus usually if the sinus is filled with air usually you will be seeing black color you can see everything is almost white in color here except here these in these lesions you will be seeing you are seeing black color if there is a black issue in color it indicates air and it is normal maxillary sinus but in but this is not the case in the total sinus maxillary sinus here you will be seeing opacity and here you are seeing air that is blackish in color so this opacity is nothing but fluid or any inflammation or hypertrophy of the nasal sinonasal mucosa so this air fluid level is a characteristic of acute maxillary sinusitis this fluid will be uh, settled in the ground uh, region and air will be present in the above region this air fluid level is a characteristic of maxillary acute maxillary sinusitis I'll be briefly telling the latter slides. Uh, what are the different views of X-ray PNS? And you, this is an anterior nasal endoscopy. See this. Uh, in the, this is a septum where I'm pointing here. This is a middle turbinate, and this is a lateral nasal wall. Okay. This is a lateral nasal uh, lateral nasal wall. This pointing, and this is a middle turbinate. You can see full and nasal discharge. The space below the middle turbinate is nothing but the middle meatus. Okay. this pollinate secretions in the middle meatus will be is coming from the anterior group of sinusitis most commonly the maxillary sinusitis maxillary sinus so uh, this it is also the diagnostic point of view or examination part of view you will be seeing pollinate nasal discharge in the middle meatus you may have a presumptive uh, assumption that uh, maxillary sinus infection is present now coming to the treatment part of uh, acute maxillary sinusitis usually if, uh, antimicrobials or antibiotics are usually not indicated uh, if the symptoms are less than 10 duration and if there is a less severity as i said before because it is mostly a viral etiology if the symptoms persist 10 more than 10 days or if there is any uh, immunocompromised patients or if the symptoms are severe in the initial presentation you should prescribe antibiotics or antimicrobial drugs so now coming to what the antibiotics will be prescribed as i said bacterial etiology strep pneumonia h influenza moraxella all of the common organisms so these ampicillin amoxicillin amoxiclav erythromycin which are all uh, will be acting against those organisms or etiological causes but usually this ampicillin and amoxicillin now became resistant usually we are preferring amoxiclav along with the amoxicillin it will be getting clavulic acid in beta lactamase producing agents to act against beta lactamase agents so amoxiclav is a drug of choice and if you will be listening from the patient sir i will i am allergic to that drug this drug this antibiotic usually the most common antibiotic used in the patients are allergic to is penicillin group of drugs so this ampicillin amoxicillin and uh, amoxiclav all comes under penicillin group of drugs so if the patient is uh, allergic to penicillin group of drugs sir you are saying amoxiclav is a drug of choice what should we do if the patient is allergic to amoxiclav or penicillin group of drugs 
you should prefer the other group of drugs or second line of drugs if the patient is allergic to penicillin group which comes under erythromycin or fluoroquinolones we will be we learned in the pharmacology fluoroquinolones nothing but levofloxacin uh, spirofloxacin and uh, norfloxacin all comes under fluoroquinolone groups or ofloxacin everything comes under ciprofloxacin every comes under fluoroquinolone groups and if the patient is allergic to penicillin group of drugs you will be prescribing those fluoroquinolones or erythromycin and now the doxycycline 100 mg bd for 7 to 14 days is also prescribed uh, if the patient is allergic to penicillin group of drugs usually uh, cephalosporins uh, are, the, are also the second choice uh, like uh, ceferoxam acetyl cefixime and cephalospor Cefalodoxin also the second group of choice uh, apart from amoxiclav. So how long will you prescribe these antibiotics? Usually the duration of treatment is up to 10 to 14 days. Uh, if you use for uh, three days, five days, and seven days, you will be getting antibiotic resistance. So whatever antibiotic uh, uh, you use after you are getting antibiotic resistance, not a single patient if the entire community is following the same uh, treatment like three days, five days, you will be uh, getting drug resistance and community resistance. So that we, these antibiotics in the future will not work. Already the, the situation has arrived. But usually the duration of treatment is 10 to 14 days. Now coming to the uh, other treatment part of you is nasal decongestant drops. These uh, nasal decongestant drops, what does this uh, actually do? As, is you, as I said, uh, the main pathophysiology lies under ostium block, which is due to inflammation and edema. So these nasal decongest will decongest, will decrease the inflammation and decrease the edema around the ostium. So if the edema and inflammation around the ostium will decrease, obviously there will be drainage of the sinus nasal secretions. So patient will be symptomatically free. So these decongestion, steam inhalation, analgesics, hot fermentation are mostly symptomatic relief. These antibiotics uh, act against main the organisms which are colonizing the stasis secretions. So both act in a mutual synergistic way. So these decongestant drops either may be systemic or local. In the systemic group, you will be having phenylephrine. Okay, phenylephrine is a drug of a drug which is which will be taken in the oral form. Uh, brand names like Cinerist. Uh, in the nasal or local application, you will be having xylometazorine or oxymetazorine. The brand names are Otrivin. You will be seeing or Orines. Uh, these are brand names which will be coming outside, selling outside. So these will decongest the nasal mucosa or ostium so that secretions will be drained. And next comes the steam inhalation. So we'll be advising the patient to take uh, steam inhalation, uh, boil uh, water and take that steam. Usually this is a household practice we'll be all doing at our homes. But when to do nasal decongestion and when to steam, we simply say do decongestion drops, uh, do steam inhalation, do tablets. So does this make any relevance? So, so the basic uh, treatment part of you or home point of view is you should always do steam inhalation after installing nasal decongestant drops only. Because so what the main purpose or function of these uh, decongestant drops is it will decrease the inflammation and edema of the ostium, right? So uh, unless there is a decreased inflammation and decreased edema around the ostium, if you take inhalation, there will be no point of taking inhalation and it will not ventilate the virus, uh, ventilate the sinuses. So if you take decongestant uh, drops before 30 minutes to steam inhalation, so there will be edema decreased and uh, there will be inflammation decreased. So that if you take inhalation, steam inhalation after installation of decongestant drop, this inhaled steam will enter uh, the sinuses mucosa and then ventilation of the sinuses. Hope this point is clear. You should take always steam inhalation after applying decongestant drops. And now comes under symptomatic treatment is analgesics. Usually due to stasis of secretion, the patient will be having uh, a pain, severe pain. Uh, so analgesics like NSAIDs like acyclopenac, uh, Combiflam or simple paracetamol or diclofenac will be preferred. 
and other symptomatic treatment is hot fomentation, yeah. applying uh, hot compressions over the cheek area or forehead region or nose region. It also comes under the medical treatment. So when do we do surgical treatment in acute rhinosinusitis? So this is the treatment part of acute rhinosinusitis. When will you do acute rhinosinusitis treatment? So if the patient is not responding to any of these, any of these medical treatments, you will be doing uh, antral lavage. What does this antral lavage mean? You will be passing a trocar and cannula through the inferior meatus into the uh, maxillary sinus, and you will be draining all the pus through this uh, surgically made uh, openings, so that sinus will be drained and the patient will be having the relief of the symptoms. Okay. Now, under sinusitis is frontal sinusitis. As the etiology of all the sinusitis is almost the same, viral rhinocytes is drying and swimming in the contaminated water. And other symptom is a frontal headache. The symptom, the typical presentation of frontal sinusitis is frontal headache. What does this frontal headache or office headache mean? The patient will be having uh, pain over the frontal region. And office headache means usually the patient will be having the worst headache in the midday or morning of the day and as the day progresses the pain, the, uh, the pain of the patient will be subsided so there will be peak in the office hours and by the end of the day the pain decreases this is typically seen in frontal sinusitis so it is known as office headache and you also be having tenderness over the this uh, superior orbital region uh, this region you will be having tenderness over this region and there will be edema of the upper eyelid because the frontal sinus is above uh, the eye. So you'll be having uh, edema of the upper eyelid. But in maxillary sinus, it is usually due to edema of the cheek and there will be edema of the lower eyelid. Okay. And apart from this, you'll be having nasal discharge, which may be pulled or non pulled So these white arrows indicate the frontal sinuses which are above the orbit. And these are the maxillary sinuses which, in, uh, which are indicated by the black arrow. So treatment point of view, the same treatment will be uh, running also in uh, frontal sinusitis, antimicrobial drugs, nasal decongestive inhalation, same treatment follows. But as in maxillary sinusitis, if the patient is not responding to medical treatment, we will be doing antral lavage, opening surgically made, opening into inferior meatus, into the maxillary sinus. But what will we do if the patient is not responding in acute frontal sinusitis to medical treatment? So there is a surgery like you can see there is a this small tube which is kept in this region. This is known as trepanation of the frontal sinus. So if there is no response of uh, <clears throat> patient to medical treatment within two days of uh, medical treatment, like as I said, antibiotics, uh, decongestion drums, if the patient is worsening uh, in spite of uh, treatment and there is no response within two days or if there is a risk of orbital cellulitis because it is more close to the orbit along with the ethanoid science sciences. So if there is a risk of orbital cellulitis or symptoms, pain, fever, edema of the lid increases in, in spite of medical treatment, then we should opt for trepanation. So what does this trepanation mean? So you will be main, making an opening into the floor of the uh, frontal sinus, just what we did in the <coughs> axillary sinus. So you will be making a horizontal incision in the superior orbital region. This is a high region. You will be uh, making a horizontal incision of about uh, one to two centimeters here, horizontal incision, which will be opening into the frontal sinus floor and we'll be drilling that uh, opening through a burr, which will want to use mastoidectomy burr, and we'll be making an opening and we'll be keeping uh, a tube through it and we'll be draining all the frontal sinuses secretions into the outside so that there is a risk of complications will be less and the patient will be improved symptomatically if there is no response to medical treatment. And you will be keeping a small tube through that opening and you will be irrigating normal saline uh, or distilled water through that so that sinus mucosa will be irrigated and there will decrease colonization of bacteria and you should do this nasal wash or saline wash until the sinus is clear and the frontal nasal duct is patent and another point is acute ethmoid sinusitis usually this ethmoid sinusitis is most commonly seen in children compared to adults as uh, the etiology is almost the same 
here the pain in ethamoid sinusitis the pain will be present over the bridge of the nose in maxillary sinusitis you will be having pressure or tenderness over the cheek area in frontal sinusitis you will be having pain over the frontal region and in ethamoid sinusitis you will be having pain or tenderness over the bridge of the nose and you also having uh, retro orbital pain you also having uh, pain over the eyes because the medial wall of the orbit is closely related to the ethamoid sinus so now comes on the pain and edema usually in ethamoid sinusitis you will be having both edema of the both lids both upper lid and lower lid in frontal you will be seeing usually upper lid in maxillary in the lower lid and in the coming to the another symptom is nasal discharge this nasal discharge may either purulent or non purulent usually it may be seen in the middle or superior meatus so why superior meatus or superior uh, middle meatus because as i said in the anatomy class this ethamoid sinus is of two types anterior group and posterior group anterior ethamoid sinus will be draining into the middle meatus and posterior ethamoid sinus will be draining into the superior meatus so if you see if you are seeing any purulent discharge in the superior meatus it may be of posterior group of ethamoid sinus if Uh, this middle meatus it may be because of anterior ethmoid sinus in this middle meatus uh, also the maxillary sinus frontal sinus or also will be draining so if you are seeing any purulent discharge in the middle meatus region as i said in the previous slide here here uh, in the middle meatus uh, it may be of frontal maxillary or anterior ethmoid but most common as a most common sinusitis is maxillary sinusitis this uh, Purulent discharge in the middle meatus is due to maxillary sinusitis. And now come to the fourth group of sinusitis is acute sphenoid sinusitis. As we said, this sphenoid sinus isolated involvement of sphenoid sinus is very rare. What does this isolated involvement means? Usually, it is accompanied with involvement of other sinuses like maxillary, frontal, or posterior ethmoid. If there is isolated involvement of sphenoid sinusitis. without any involvement of other sinuses you should suspect some feature some diagnosis like mucosal of the sphenoid sinus or neoplasm of the sphenoid sinus so you should be kept in mind usually because sphenoid sinusitis is not a single entity or isolated entity it is a part of pan sinusitis so if you are seeing any isolated involvement of sphenoid sinus in the ct scan you should think or rule out mucosal of the sphenoid or uh, sinus or neoplasm of the sphenoid sinus because in these two cases also mucosal or neoplasm usually the patient presents with sphenoid sinusitis or acute sphenoid sinusitis so make sure you should rule out these conditions in sphenoid sinusitis especially isolated involvement of sphenoid sinus okay hope this point is very clear a uh, brief re uh, review of the pain hello location wise maxillary sinus usually you will be having pain over the cheek or upper teeth region in the frontal sinus you will be having forehead or eyebrow region and in the mid region you will be having retropalpar region and in coming to maxillary sinusitis the pain the pain or the if there is a maxillary sinusitis the pain will be worse when the patient is cupping or bending downwards so but in frontal sinusitis usually the headache is worse in the midday and will be improved in the night time evening time and coming to the periodicity uh, usually worse on waking because there will be a pooling of uh, secretions for uh, recumbent position when the patient wakes up subsides uh, as upright posture reduces nasal condition you all patient you all will be encountering nasal congestion while we sleep so this is a normal phenomena is also known as nasal cycle there will be alternate congestion and uh, decongestion of nasal uh, mucosa which is known as a nasal cycle which will be more experienced if you are in a lateral position rather than supine position so when we worse when we wake up from uh, early morning it will be worse and as the days progresses in upright posture the nasal condition decreases and subsides as in the previous uh, starting of the lecture i said this acute ars is a mostly a clinical diagnosis rather than a investigations or diagnosis i mean examination i mean like uh, clinical diagnosis so now coming to the what examination you will do 
So now coming to the examination point of view, uh, briefly you should examine the anti rhinoscope. You will be keeping a tudiculum uh, nasal speculum in the nose. You will be seeing whether purulent discharge in the middle vena has nature of the mucosa and any anatomy of anatomical abnormalities like deviated nasal septum, uh, hypertrophic turbulence. All you should visualize in the anti rhinoscope. And you should also visualize the presence or absence of purulent discharge in the middle vena. Because it may give diagnosis or clue to the uh, rhinosinusitis. And also, you should inspect posterior rhinoscopy. In posterior, if posterior ethmoid group or spinoid sinus uh, spinous are involved, usually you will see uh, seeing uh, purulent discharge along the posterior uh, pharyngeal wall. So, posterior rhinoscopy uh, usually uh, benefit here. Another examination point is nasal endoscopy, also known as diagnostic nasal endoscopy. Usually, this is more uh, useful to see the origin of the discharge, either from middle meatus, superior meatus, or like this. And it also used to take uh, the sample for culture, especially in immunocompromised patients, to keep the uh, drug of choice, antibiotic of choice. And under is trans simulation, which is less predictive. And under examination is uh, nasal cytology or nasocinal biopsy. What is this cytology? Means you will be taking a smear or test like. In order to rule out the allergic rhinitis, is no field count and also in aspirin sensitivity. By taking the nasal cell culture or nasal cytology for culture, you will be ruling out isnophilia, which rules out allergic causes, and also to rule out aspirin sensitivity. Aspirin sensitivity usually seen in SAM triad. In SAM triad, you will be having patient having aspirin insensitivity, nasal polyposis, and sinusitis. These three comes under SAM triad. So, in order to rule out that, we can do nasal cytology. And we also should do tests for immunodeficiency if there is patient having not responding to med medical treatment or surgical treatment, HIV, diabetics, everything. And now comes next investigation is X-ray paranasal sinuses and CTPNS. So briefly, I will tell X-ray paranasal sinuses. There are three views. Water's view, here the water's view, the patient will be uh, standing here to the x-ray plate, x-ray plate and the beam will be coming from the back. This is occipit region. This is also known as occipitomental region. Mentum. This is a mentum or chin region which is touching the plate and the x-ray beam will be coming from the back. This is also known as water's view. Water's view or occipitomental view. If the patient is with the open mouth, this is known as open mouth water's view. And if it is the patient with the same view, if there is a closed mouth, it is known as water's view. In water's view, the most commonly, this is a water's view, also known as occipital mental view. the picture here. The, in water's view, the sinus most commonly seen is a maxillary sinus. So if, if there is a question like which is a X-ray paranasal sinus view, best for maxillary sinus, the answer should be water's view. Sometimes you may get an option like occipital mental view. You should not confuse. Both are same. Water's view and occipital mental view view are same. So, so I showed this picture. The mentum is touching here. So, beam is coming from the occipit region. So, occipital mental view, also known as water's view, this is the best for necessary sinus. Other sinuses can also be visualized. In the same view, if there is an open mouth, you will be visualizing spin out sinus. So, same view. If there is open mouth, the point where I'm showing, you will be seeing the spinoid sinus through the open mouth. And now comes the Caldwell view. Caldwell view means occipitofrontal view. So this is a Caldwell view, occipitofrontal view. Here both the occiput, I mean this forehead and chin will be touching the both plate. And the beam is coming from the occiput region. If, so occiput region touching anterior side, occipitofrontal view or uh, occipital nasal view. Here, the best view, best sinus which is visualized is frontal sinus. So, you may get the question like which is the best view for frontal sinus means the answer should be Caldwell view or occipital frontal view. Okay, in so briefly, this is the description of X ray paranasal sinuses. So, what are the signs? That's the last slide X ray of sinusitis in air fluid level and sinus opacity. As I said in the previous slide, there will be air fluid level in the 
if you see any air fluid level in the maxillary sinus, you will be suspecting acute maxillary rhinosinusitis. And there will be opacity, there will be clouding. The always the opacity of the maxillary sinus or any sinus should be compared with the opacity of the orbit. See. See, uh, you see in this picture, this is the opacity, this is the orbit, this is the orbit, this is the maxillary sinus. Here the opacity of the orbit and uh, the sinus is same. Here it is different. So you should suspect this here the maxillary sinus it is opacity. So, but the gold standards uh, for diagnosis of any sinusitis, uh, most probably the chronic sinusitis, especially before going for surgery, is the CT paranasal sinuses. So, with this, the class is over. Thank you. In the next class, we'll be dealing uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. Mr. Siya, Jyoti Prakash, please keep the attendance. Okay, sir. Okay.